Now, here's the hosts of Top Story, Kelly Glass and Jill Sweeney. Good morning, Jill. Good morning, Kelly. I was wondering if you were going to get here. It was tough. The farm equipment. The farm equipment. <laughs> there was this huge thing. I don't even know what it was. So now you're but beating I could up hardly... on the farmers. <laughs> there were about five or six cars. I was going down Sugar Factory Road because that's the way I go. Probably maybe mm, three miles an hour in this huge line. And I'm like, I got to get out of here because I'm not going to make it to work. So I... I Cut out on, uh, I think it was Hankins. I couldn't last even longer. It was taking so wow. long. Um, yeah. Lots I was of like, farm oh, equipment no. on the roads right now with harvest season wrapping up and such. And... What's the etiquette? Are they supposed to? I know it was huge, so I don't even well, know if I could pull over, but you're like, okay, there's a parking lot somewhere. Get in there and let us all pass. Unless I am mistaken and if there are some exemptions, but I don't believe there are. If you are holding up more than three vehicles, you're supposed to pull over and let them go around. Oh, is that it? Yeah. I don't think he was, uh, he must not have known that. Yeah, and I don't know. And I know that, and that I understand. farm equipment is huge now. No, and it's I, I've tough. never even seen stuff yeah. so big. I know. They got some I'm big like, stuff well, I don't even there. know what it is. But um, yeah, but when you're backed up going like two miles an hour, or three miles an hour, and you're like, well, oh, no. I'm sure oh, no. it's faster than that. I don't. I don't think there like were a lot. Maybe 10 or 12, maybe. I don't think so. It was very <laughs> slow. Very slow. Slower than you could walk? Um, it was slow. And so then I was like, that's when I decided to pull off. Another call, car pulled off, and I thought, you know, I got to pull off. You're a trendsetter, so you pulled off and other people followed No, you. I followed someone else. Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought that's a good idea. I got to pull off, too. Yeah, well, anyway, but, you, know, you I understand. Here, I understand. I know I understand they have their work, and I, under, I get all that, and I, you know, try to. But when you've got five or six cars and trucks behind you, uh, yeah, I know. It, That's it's, tough. it's just kind of it's kind of like school bus, you know. School buses are irritating. Well, you don't yes. go around them, and you don't. Pa- I saw a story on ABC News last night about school buses, like people driving around them, almost I know. hitting kids. People are crazy. Um, people are crazy. I don't get that. And oh, and we have the cops on today. We do. We so have. So we can uh, ask him about it. Twin Falls PD officer uh, Stephen Gassard. He is a school resource officer, mm-hmm. and he'll be telling us about his bully bucket program. That's right. I think yeah. it's pretty successful. We're going to postpone him for about five minutes. We're going to have him from 840 till 9. He'll have a longer segment this morning to explain that program. Then we'll have Linda Fleming, who's coming in from a Habitat for Humanity Restore. Mm-hmm. they got a big event coming up, so mm-hmm. we'll have her at 830. Then at 9 o'clock, we have Twin Falls Su- uh, School Superintendent Dr. Wiley Dobbs. Here a while back, it was announced that the Twin Falls School District was having to lay off a lot of part-time workers because of the Affordable Care Act. So we're going to have him come in and explain that and ask questions. And Yeah. So it should be an interesting show today. Oh, I think so. Uh, before we get started uh, with our news, let's go ahead and take this call, shall we? Top story, you're on the air. Good morning. Good morning, Jill. That piece of equipment is an Idaho bagel maker. <laughs> so they start by harvesting the wheat. Yeah. Was that a com- So it might have been a combine, huh? I, no, I don't know what it was. I don't oh, know. It was like I'm asking huge, the wrong person, wasn't it? Aren't I? Don't I? Don't yeah, what it yeah. was. Tom will sometimes quiz me when we see these big things because I'll be like, oh my gosh, this thing looks like a transformer. You know, like the ones where the wheels are so tall you could like drive in oh, between yeah, it? Yeah. And I'll say, what is that? I'm like, I don't know. He always quizzes me. Well, the big wheels where you could drive underneath it, yeah. those are sprayers. The really tall ones. Yeah, the really well, huge, huge wheels. If you can walk under them, those are the sprayers, and then they put these big sprayer booms out, and then they spray. I don't know. So, but anyway, anyway. this time of year, you'd probably running into beet harvesters and maybe some combines finishing up the uh, probably the bean harvest or something. Probably. But anyway, that's you know, it's just kind of one of those things around here. They're just gonna get us ready. If it for bothers when... you, maybe you should consider moving elsewhere because that's just the way it is. Oh, that, that, this you is know a farming what? That area. answer on anything is so stupid. I hate that area. answer. I, I get it, do, but, but when you're in a, a rush, area. oh Kelly, you of all people who drive, you can't stand when people drive 30 miles an hour on Blue Lakes and you're if sitting there. If they have the capacity of, of driving the speed limit, yeah, it irritates come me. But on. if it's a piece of farm, because I've been there, done that, and oh, I know what it's gosh. like to drive heavy equipment down the road and people are mad at you and giving you the New York salute and stuff I would like never that. do that. I turned off. I just wor- was worried I was going to be late for the show, but I guess this will give us practice and me, um, my little zen moment in the car when I see 400 people riding their bicycles to Cliff Bar. 
<laughs> so, on my roads, which I don't even know how that's possible. You of all people should think that's great, you know, being, being the environmentalist that you are and the health nut that you are. That should, hey, you should that's think fine. That's These roads are not made for this. There is no media, there's no edge, there's nothing. You can't, I'm like, good luck. I don't get it. I mean, it's fine if we have the infrastructure for it. Look at the, come out to where I live. Why don't you come out to where I live someday? I know where you live. And look at the infrastructure of these roads on Sugar Factory Road. Come on. <laughs> You got wow. the trucks. You're going to have 400 bicyclists dry, riding to work. I'm like, well, there's going to be, someone's going to be killed. When Jill got here today, she had one nerve left to pluck. It's and gone. I, and I plucked that it. one's gone. Seven, three, yeah, six, you plucked it. Seven, three, it is six, now gone. Zero, three hundred. Top story. You're on the air. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, I've been that guy in the tractor. And I've also been the guy driving truck who's got a schedule to keep and it it can be irritating absolutely yeah it can be however you must remember you could live somewhere where food could cost you a lot more money that's true you know the point i'm not mad at the farmers i get it i understand i'm just saying sometimes when you're in a rush venting she's just venting huh more taxes and more roads well, see if they, if they that would if be they, nice if, if we, we did that if nice we made roads. bigger roads then that would mean uh, widening them which would be extremely expensive and then you would be taking up more farmland to make the wider roads. Oh, we're taking up so. farmland for the manufacturing plants, so you know. <laughs> Here we go. Why not sit there and, and make it wider go. so everyone can function? Hey, Holy smokes. don't get me wrong. I love the farmers. I love where I live. I love egg. All I said was, I didn't think I was going to get here today. I got here with, what, five minutes to spare? <laughs> That's all I'm saying. I took Hankins, okay? I took Hankins, then I took Kimberly, and then I got to work. That's all I'm saying was I was worried I wasn't going to make it, and well, I was very late today. I will say this, and I farmed. Please say back, something. I farmed back in the '80s, yeah. And uh, back then, I thought equipment was fairly big, but the equipment that we had back then that most of us farmed with was not as big as what I've noticed on the roads today. I mean, if you had a 12, 14 foot disc back then, you know that was about the average size. Some of them had the the swing wings on them that would lay down and. And stuff, but but they were, you know, they would be folded up going down the road. But now, I mean, I go down the road even on Highway 74. Uh, there are just huge, huge pieces of equipment, and I think, man, man that would have been cool to have had that back when I farmed. <laughs> and at times, like I just wish I had something with a cab. So, yeah, well, true. <laughs> back that's, in the day, I know. I mean, they that, were baking in the thing. sun. So. so that you know, that's just the way it is. The farms, uh, farmers, there are. Fewer farmers farming more ground now, and in order to get across that ground, you got to have bigger equipment to do it. So. You know, you started this whole thing. You said I didn't think you were going to make it here, <laughs> I know, and it's I my said fault. I didn't either. It's my fault. I know. It's my fault. I started it. I should have just kept my mouth shut. Well, I'm just saying. I do know this though: a second healthcare worker at a Dallas hospital who provided care for the first Ebola patient diagnosed in the U.S. has officially tested positive for the disease according to the Texas uh, Department of State Health Services. Now, I don't know about you, but here in the last few days, it has kind of, and this is not, please, don't get me wrong, this is not a Republican, a Democrat thing. This is just an observation I'm making that our government, our facilities seem to be overwhelmed with in, with incompetence. I mean, we, we don't know what to do. Somebody says, uh, uh, oh, we're doing this, and then the people who are actually in the pits doing it saying, no, we're not, and and it just seems like the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. We got the uh, Ebola seems to be spreading. Listening to a doctor last night, he says, don't worry, we're going to have a few, a few cases of Ebola, but it's not going to turn out to be an epidemic. But it just seems like that things are just going from bad to worse, and nobody seems to know what to do. Well, I don't know if that's... it's. I mean, the thing of it is, is you have the human factor. If the nurse at Texas Presbyterian Hospital would have, at that moment when the man said he was from Liberia, asked him if he ever could have had contact with someone with Ebola, and the guy said, yes, or she should have just said, let's, let's test you, this wouldn't have happened. So, you know, I, I don't know what to say. They I knew, am- the doctors knew. They said they all got the same records. They now said they all got it. They all saw it was from Liberia. 
Uh, you got a human factor going on there, and you can never control Agreed. that. But then, but then you got the the nurses who are saying, you know what? They're, we didn't get uh, our our uh, suits in time. They aren't any good. They don't. You know, we have no instruction. Ta da ta da da da. It's almost like uh, they should have the, just uh, sent. He said, she said. They should have sent the man if they found out he had Ebola to the, the hospitals that are prepared instead of. I don't know what they were thinking in Texas. But then again, I lived in Texas for six years, and I can say this. A lot of times you don't know what they're thinking in Texas. It just happens. I don't get it. I don't know. Um, I don't know. Maybe they didn't know what Liberia, Liberia was or well, where. Maybe they figured it would be more dangerous to transport them someplace else than it would be to just they keep just them They just transported there. the second nurse to Emory. Well, but they, they didn't transport that's because the, Dallas the first said, nurse. We don't want any more. Our hands are full. They had no choice. The first nurse. Well, we had Cheryl Becker here said we were prepared. I don't know. 736 Top story. You're on the air. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Well, I thought that was a bit of a slam to Texas. I've lived there, too. Hey, I live there. It, it is well, sometimes it's, it's a slam. I, I live there, too. Remember, they've got some uh, pretty pretty good med schools there. But anyway, I did hear this on one of the morning shows, okay. that the latest nurse actually called the CDC yes. and said, hey, I've got a, I've got a fever. It's 99 point, uh, 99 and a half. I want to go to Ohio, see some relatives, and a Someone, I don't know who, they didn't report, said, well, you don't fall under the parameters of the Ebola sideboards or whatever it is, so right. go ahead and go on the Go ahead and go on the plane. 101 the, degrees. I think this was her flight back from Cleveland to Dallas because when she landed, the fever was the next day. You know, it, it, she, was fine, See, she was fine going I mean. out. That, that makes my point. Nobody knows really what to say or how to say it or when to say it. Uh, it's almost like but they're kind of making it up as they go. But then again, she's a nurse. She came from a hospital with an Ebola patient who died. Why are you calling the CDC? Why not go to a hospital and say, give me a test? I might have Ebola. Like, okay, why would you even... Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, is there no common sense? She I is know. a nurse. Oh, I know. I You're know, calling the I CDC? Know. That's what I'm saying. Nobody seems to know what to do. Even you're the in a hospital where the guy died. Your, 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 um, your friend who's a nurse has Ebola. You don't think, wow, I might have Ebola? I, where is the common sense? I don't get I don't, it. Well, common sense went out the door i think a long time ago but i agree no i agree even the nurse who's coming down with a fever thinking especially since she had been treating one yeah it treated should have the registered. guy who then, died and she calls the cdc which yeah is kind of a duh but even the cdc said oh no you're fine you're fine go ahead. see nobody knows she knew and that's a little disconcerting to me she knew what's wrong with these the duncan guy knew hello hello they knew what is going on? Seven three six. Don't act like they don't know. Zero three hundred is the number to call. We'll be right back. Seven three six zero three zero zero is the number to call here on Top Story. Welcome back. Uh, also, the folks at Canyon Pond would like to welcome you. Uh, Canyon Pond is uh, on Shoshone Street, and it is Twin Falls' newest pawn shop. Uh, Dave Hansen and the crew say, "Come on down, see all of our guns, see." Uh, all of our camping stuff, see all of our fishing poles, see all of our woodworking equipment, tools, anything you would expect to see in a pawn shop. You will see it in the nice, new, clean Canyon Pond right across the street from Will's Toyota. You can give them a call at 933-2600. You can visit them online at canyonpond.com. They're also on Facebook, Canyon Pond. They're everywhere. You can't get away from them. Nor would you want to. So stop mm. in, see what they got. If you don't uh, see anything that interests you today, stop in again tomorrow. Because then there will probably be something, because that's the way a pawn shop is. The I guess we is... still haven't gone. we got to make a <clears throat> lunch date. I know, Jill. I know. Things have just been Maybe so Maybe next busy. week. Yeah. Maybe next week we can do that. We Since do I was that. on vacation, you were just slammed. <laughs> I was. I was. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you what, since since the federal government has all kinds of money now, since the economy has has been fixed and everything is fine and the they got more money than they knew, know what to do with and they got more money than they can spend in Washington, the federal government is spending more than $2 million to develop a wearable insole and buttons that can track a person's weight in order to fight obesity. The National Institutes of Health has awarded grants for two projects that will monitor lifestyle behavior through technologies that will 
encourage people to exercise more. The first project awarded to Smart Move Inc., a company that provides physical activity coaching solutions, is creating insoles that will track a person's weight. A single device that accurately monitors body weight, posture allocation, physical activity, and energy expenditure would be an extremely useful tool for weight management, the grant's abstract states. The insoles work with a mobile phone app that would show the user their weight and physical activity levels. A video shows a person using an early prototype in 2011 while walking around a fountain. You know, I'm surprised of all the things in life that have been invented up to this point. Why hasn't somebody figured this out? We could have something that we could stand on or something that would show us our way. I even have a name for it. We could call it a bathroom scale. Somebody before didn't after, think of that. Before after, I'm well, shocked. I'm surprised the footwear industry hasn't come up with it. They come up with all sorts of things. You step down and the lights light up under your kid's shoes, which, by the way, Reebok turned that technology down when it was first presented to <laughs> yeah, them. Is that right? Sort of guy. They thought, oh, no, that's never going to sell. You <coughs> cannot see a little kid without the shoes lighting up. <laughs> Crazy. Yeah, anyway. It's like the guy who sold the patent for the paperclip for 100 bucks or something yeah, like, like that many, many decades ago. Anyway, I'm surprised they <laughs> even thought of it. Now, can you imagine? Yeah, we don't think that's a good idea. All right, great. Anyway, but the point is, uh, $2 million compared to uh, the millions we're going to spend in the obesity epidemic. You know what? I don't know if I would use it, and I don't know how you would get it. I know they have those Fit Band things right yes, now yes. that tell you all this stuff. Um, I don't know. Maybe it would help someone. Maybe standing on there does it. I don't know where you get the weight. Do you have to then go to your program or? Yeah, and everything shows doing? up on your on your oh, on your smartphone. smartphone. So before here, you eat, and then after you eat. Well, <laughs> why is it that we are developing these expensive solutions for simple problems? Because people I like mean, technology. You can get a bathroom scale for fifteen bucks. You, you know, could. instead, this is probably going to be a hundred and fifty dollar deal that everybody's going to buy so and so for Christmas this year, and everybody's going to use it for the first week, and then after that, it's going to. But you then know, it's go also the measures again. your posture allocation, your oh, physical man. activity. Some people like to know. You know, you got those little um, pedometers, how many steps you take. Why and... don't they leave it up to private industry? You know, I mean, instead they're spending two million dollars of our money to come up with with something like this. Really, Kelly? How do you think the oil industry got um, uh, got developed? We invested as a government. We still do. Hello. They help private industry to develop things. That's how it works. But you know what? If there's a grant for it, we get grants all the time in this city for stuff. Oh, we got a grant for this, a grant for that. Oh, I agree. So, you I know, agree. Um, I don't know. If it helps people... We have an obesity epidemic in this country. We Seven, really do. So I'm just saying that that's probably not going to fix it. Seven three six zero three hundred. Might help. I don't Top know. story. You're on the air. Good morning. Good morning. How are you, you know, today? I'm, I'm 25. I I uh, did sports all my life, and uh, you know a mirror really helps <laughs> yeah. keep your focus on it as well. That's right. Well, you know and you probably I... already have one of those. <laughs> Or just, uh, as long as I can remember. Or just when you put your pants on, you sort of, you know, actually, we don't have a scale. I actually don't recommend people to have scales. Do you want to know why? Because it's depressing. Well, okay, say you gain five pounds, you eat yeah. more. Say you lose five pounds, you eat more. So either way, it's not your friend. <laughs> yeah. How many times do you lose weight oh, and you're great. like, okay. I, I lost can... five pounds. I can have a little bit more now because right. I you know lost what I'm five saying? pounds. And it tortures you all day long. I'm like, you know, I give it to well, your Well, then why would this enemy. be any different? Why would this app know. that we I, spend I our government know. money on, our taxpayer money on, that won't be any different. We're going to spend a lot on the obesity epidemic. If it helps some people, But this great. isn't going to fix it. I this don't isn't going to fix it. They should actually send everyone my cookbook. That would help now fix it. Now you're talking. I'm surprised you didn't bring that up earlier for well, crying out loud. I can only think of so much this early. We have Linda Fleming next with the Habitat for Humanity Restore, a big uh, fundraising event coming up right here on Top Story. Then we'll have uh, Officer Stephen Gassert with the Twin Falls PD. And then at 9 o'clock, it's Twin Falls School Superintendent Dr. Wiley Dobbs. Seven three six zero three zero zero is the number to call here this morning on Top Story. Welcome back. We have Linda Fleming from Habitat for Humanity Restore. Good morning, Linda. Good, Good morning. morning to you. We had you in a while back talking about the home is where the art is, and that is coming up. We are about three weeks out, yes. Wow. So tell us what that is and how it works. 
This is a brand new night that is going to be really, really fun. We are working in cooperation with the Magic Valley Arts Council, two nonprofits here in the in the Magic Valley. On Saturday, November 8th, we're going to do an art and antique auction. We'll have new, um, well, not new, we'll have art from fine art, from Hi. like artists here locally, or things that have been donated, and as well as items from the ReStore, things that have been repurposed and made into something really unusual and fun. I've got a beautiful table that's covered with copper pennies right now that one of our oh, wow. one of our volunteers did. Um, Is that legal? Yeah, uh, well, <laughs> you can pick them all off if you want. <laughs> But the fun thing that we've added is going to happen uh, an art and antique appraisal, appraisal. tent. Boy, my, I'm tongue-tied at the second. That's okay. <laughs> it happens sometimes. Um, an appraisal fair, basically kind of like uh, the Antiques Roadshow, Antiques yeah, Roadshow cool. action. Exactly. From 4 until 7, and we'll have a local expert there to take a look at your treasures. You bring them in for a oh. small donation of $5. Take a look at it and see if it's trash or is it treasure. And this is mm. interesting because last time you were in, I told you that I had this picture that the glass broke and I didn't want to spend the money to reframe. And I'm just done with her. I bought her in my 20s. I loved her. But you know how you just move on. Yep. So I took it over to you. Uh, you did. And, and I, I did I, some I, research. Right. I spent $325 on it in my 20s, which was way more than I could even afford. But I loved her. And you called me and said or told me. Jill, are you sure this gal is worth seventeen hundred dollars now? Seventeen hundred dollars. <laughs> no kidding. And I that's said, great. I said, well, Linda, you'll make a lot of money. So anyway, that's so she's going to be. Auctioned. We have a very nice Hoffman lithograph yeah, donated amazing. by your very favorite Jill. Yeah, <laughs> Douglas <laughs> Hoffman. I always well, knew that, he'd be a good artist. That should yeah. raise the value of it <laughs> yeah. just from Jill Skeen. It, Why owned not? by someone yeah. famous, local, exactly. local, rich and famous Something. celebrity. Yeah. yeah. Well, I don't know about that, but anyway, so that's kind of exciting to find out. Uh, you know, that's the kind artwork. of things that that we're getting in. We have some beautiful large. Um, duck prints that are always very very um, popular we also have some pottery we have a actually a large pot that was wood fired the family had to stay up for five days no. and actually wood fired this pot it's amazing we've got jewelry coming in we've got all sorts of beautiful items wow so it's going to be a, a really a night not to be missed and when is the night november 8th it's Saturday, November 8th, and from 4 to 7, we'll have that appraisal tent going on, silent auctions, food, and also some live music. So you just kind of spend the afternoon strolling around, putting your bitter number down on many, many things. And then from 7 to 8, we'll have the live auction of some of the larger items. Oh, awesome. Um, lamps, beautiful couch tables, some craftsman era nice. items. Will mine be live auction, do you think? I think so. Ooh, Why wow. not? Big money, big money. Yeah, right now, what I'm going to bid. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and donations are being accepted still, um, either through at the ReStore, Wednesday through Friday, 9 to 6, or Saturday, 9 to 2, and then also at the Magic Valley Arts Council. You can see a beautiful uh, checkered game table that one of wow. our um, volunteers has done outside of the Magic Valley Arts Council. It's, it's going to be... A really interesting conglomeration of items. Sounds Something like for it. everybody. Yeah. Price ranges for everybody. That's now, right. is, uh, is there tax deductible slips available for some of this stuff? The, How does that work? Any item that you were to donate to us, yes, you would receive a, a tax donation letter for that item. It, and you can donate it either to the Magic Valley Arts Council or to Habitat for Humanity. It doesn't matter. We're both nonprofits doing yeah. great things in this community. Absolutely. So, and how's then, the money? Where does the money go? We're going to split it 50 50. Okay. Way this is a cooperation. This is nice. kind of a first time deal for. I think it sounds great. It's a great idea. So, yeah. If nothing else, it's just a lot of fun. Sounds yes. like. But also, you said that, you know, because my thing was appraised, you said anything under $5,000, you can just, what, be appraised somewhat, and you can take the difference between what you, you paid and what you. 
you always want to talk to your tax man. Right. I, I'm not not your tax <laughs> man. Linda Fleming's giving tax <laughs> advice. <laughs> but there are ways that you can yes. get a bigger donation with the amount it's worth, right? Correct. If you if you are knowing what the value of that item is and you're donating it to a charity, you we give you a letter that says you donated a beautiful Hoffman print. It was this number, that number signed lithograph yeah. and and you take it from there okay right. so where can they go to, for more information on this linda more information is available at our website habitatmagicvalley.org or just give us a call 735-1233 all right very good it's really cool in there you got to go in there and look at least Oh, I'm going in to buy a couple of doors. Are you? A couple of doors. So okay. I'm going to go in this week and buy some. All right. So awesome. I'll look then. Thank you, Linda Thanks, Fleming Linda. from Habitat for Humanity Restore. Great event. Thank you. And we'll be right back with officers uh, Steve, man. Gassard. Gassard, yeah, with the Twin Falls Police Department. Okay, we'll be right back. Seven three six zero three zero zero is the number to call here this morning on Top Story. You're going to find out about the Bully Bucket program at the local schools here shortly. But first, wanted to tell you about Clearwater Power Equipment. Now, they've been in the Wood River Valley area for many, many years, and they decided to expand to the Twin Falls area. So they now have a store in Twin Falls that we've been talking about. They carry Husqvarna. They carry Echo. And you know what? That's all they do. They are experts. They know what they're talking about. You, you, you don't... You don't have to worry about the answers that you get being just something off the top of their head because they work in the lumber department somewhere. So uh, stop by 252 Washington Street, 734-7767. It's chainsaw and leaf blower season. They got them both. And uh, they got the Echo Brand chainsaws, Echo Brand leaf blowers. And with the wind that we've been having and such and the cooler temperatures, we're going to have more leaves falling. The wind yesterday was terrible. Yeah, well, boy, just all of a sudden, too. Yeah. So... uh, Give them a call, and uh, they're in the old, the former General Building Supply Building, and they'll be happy to uh, happy to hear you, hear from you. Okay, sorry, I'm, Are you, I'm re-signing it's really back hard in for here. Him to do the show when he's doing <laughs> just, other things. I, I know. I just I can't. Oh, look, there's a squirrel. I know. I just can't multitask Shiny object. <laughs> anymore. But I was trying to get to this. <laughs> well, you know, we can't have the police in without playing their theme song exactly that's bet you we have uh, it actually it automatically comes with them we don't even have to hit a button <laughs> it's yeah. programmed that but way they come walking in and all yeah. of a sudden we all start hearing that song we have officer steven gasser with us from the twin falls police department good morning good sir. morning good morning thanks for having me you sure. bet now you're the school resource officer right i am a, a school i am resource. one of the school resource officers for the police department okay how many do we have we have five total we have one in every high school every middle school and then one in the alternative high school Wow. Okay, so you guys are busy. You kind of move around too, don't you? We do. We also um, cover all of the elementary schools, and then we've started working with our local charter schools and uh, other schools, private schools, working with them to kind of assist them as well. Wow. What do the kids think when they see you? You know, we've we've built a pretty good relationship with the kids, and you know, we spend a lot of time interacting with them in the lunch rooms and in the hallways, and. Um, some of us attend sporting events and help coach after school activities oh, nice. and things like that. So we've we've been able to really build a rapport with them and, and allow them to see that there is another side to law enforcement other right. than taking people to jail. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> and it's kind of a mission for, for you too, isn't it? It's kind of like being a teacher. You're not it in is. it for the money or the fame or the fortune. You're you're in it because you. Yeah, it's a mission. Yeah, we kind of attack it from a three prong attach uh, attack. We're we're first and foremost, law enforcement. So we're there to to investigate crimes and, and make sure that the school's staying safe. But we're also um, teachers. Uh, most of us um, specialize in different topics that we go into the classrooms and teach and, and work with the students on tobacco and alcohol and drugs and mm-hmm. school safety and things like that. And then we're also kind of uh, also a counselor where we work with the kids on life problems and things going on at home or things in their personal lives. They can come in and sit down and talk with us and we can try and work through them. So you're kind them. of a Jack and Jill of all trades then. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Um, now, you were in uh, some time back and talked about your Bully Bucket program. Yes. What is that and how's it going? So back in February of 2013, I launched the Bully Bucket program, which is a program where at Robert Stewart, there's a bucket in our library where students who are being bullied or um, have some sort of student that's causing an issue for them, can go in and fill out a slip, put it in the bucket, um, and then I go and retrieve those twice a day and, and investigate it and look into it 
determine exactly what happened, what went on, and whether or not um, there needs to be any consequences. And do then they w- put their name on it, or is it just anonymous? They can remain anonymous. So um, how do you follow that up on? Messes how up do you the point though? But how do you follow up, up on it if you just say one kid bullied me? I mean, do they say who the kid is? They they put on there um, who's bullying them, what they're doing, where it's happening at, and if there's any witnesses or anyone else saw it. Um, and so far, most all of the ones that have been put in there, the kids are actually putting their names on the form. I, I've gone into the classrooms and met with the kids and had assemblies and the kids are, are pretty understanding that, you know, I, I'm going to handle this with um, kid gloves, I guess you could say, where I'm not going to bring someone in and say, you know, Johnny came in and told me that you did this to him. Um, you know, most of the kids don't know exactly where I get the information from. But they know who they bullied, right? So they're probably like, I'm going to kill that kid when I see him now, right? But, but when, when, when it comes to bullying, if you're bullying one kid, you're probably bullying another one. Oh, so they might go, and, oh, who are and, and so it, it's, a, it's kind of, I look at it as you're doing this to other kids. You know, mm-hmm. I don't specifically say, did you do this to, to Johnny or, or Mary or anything like that? Um, you know, teachers are observing that you're maybe not being kind to other students or oh. in the lunchroom, this was observed by the lunchroom lady. And um, usually it's not, a, that's one of the things about bullying that's kind of sometimes hard for some people to understand is for it to actually be true and legit bullying, it has to be repeated. It has to be over, you know, a, a certain amount of time. It can't just be one isolated incident to actually be constituting bullying. And so if if it's that's happening to one student, it's happening to other students. And so we look at it from that approach. So how does it affect the bullier? I mean, do they stop? Do they realize? I mean, do you have to give them some therapy? Is it happening at home? I mean, really, like what yeah, changes your behavior? I can imagine behavior? some therapy that I would be. Do you know? <laughs> like, but really, I mean, those are not, that's not normal to be mean like that. It's not. And that's usually when I bring the, the kid in that's um, doing the bullying and sit down with them and see exactly what's causing them to act like this is they they are they having issues at home um are they having issues with another kid are they being bullied and so they're you know to make themselves feel better better passing right. on the bullying on to someone else and and i sit down with them and i and i i see exactly what's causing them to be to be mean like this and if it's issues going on at home then that's when i get in contact with parents and say hey this is what's going on can we work as a team to try and figure out what's going on um, if it's issues at school, I usually try and get one of our school counselors involved to say, hey, can we work with this student to maybe get his self-esteem back up or whatever it may be to to, to be causing the situation. And then unfortunately, sometimes it reaches to the point to where, um, you know, I might have to look at getting the court system involved to to maybe see if there's some resources through the court system um, to, hmm. to get them involved. So how about how many entries do you have in your bucket list on an average day? Well, the first year that I did this program, I had over 130 um, put into it for that one school year. Um, The number of reports into the bully bucket have gone down, but I contribute a lot of that to the fact that the students, um, now that I've been in the schools for several years and they understand that I I take this very seriously, are coming and reporting things to me in person Uh, more than than putting them into the bucket. They come into my office and say, I have to talk to you about a situation that's gone on. So do you think Um, it's gotten better or worse? Or, I mean... It's definitely gotten better. Um, At our school, at least, I I, I really feel that um, the students have accepted this as their own program and have kind of taken it over. And and there's there's several times, you know, a week that I hear kids walking down the hallway saying, you need to stop that and be nice uh, to that kid or leave that kid alone or else I'm going to report you to Officer Gassert. Um, mm. and, and so the kids have really started to adopt it as their own program um, and, and kind of take control of it, and, and I'm able to just kind of step back and allow them to, to kind of make it their own. But I, I truly believe that it's made a, a huge difference on the amount of um, extreme bullying cases that we've had at Robert Stewart. You know, I, I would like to say that we're going to completely get rid of bullying. Um, I wish I could say that. But it's one of those I don't think that we'll ever truly able to get rid of it completely 100%. Do they yeah. ever? Um, do you ever deal with uh, when someone bullies someone in social media? Yes. Um, because that seems to be a huge, and that is more I think traumatic for kids because it's everywhere. Yes, and in, in with social media, how easy it is to post something on there and then you know go on there and take it off or or privacy settings and things like that is law enforcement. It's really hard for us to investigate those 
because of the fact that kids, when they get find out that I might be investigating it, can hop on Facebook on their cell phones or their iPods or anything and, and get the post taken off. And yeah. so it's really hard for us to investigate those and, and to handle those. And um, What do you think the biggest cause of bullying is? Because um, it doesn't start with the kids. You don't grow up. You just don't come out and, and become a bullier. Like, what do you think is causing them to do this? Is it home? I, I think a majority of it is a learned behavior. Um, that, that sometimes there's, there's situations where some kids might not be taught the life skills of, of being kind and respectful and that everyone deserves the right to be able to go to school and not be picked on and not be teased. Can um, you imagine that many parents, though, out there that are really this bad that pass this on do you know what i'm saying because it seems yeah. like it's huge and, amounts and, and i'm not so sure though that it's always the parent that they learn it from the parents exactly and it's not exactly the 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 parents that i think that they're learning it from aunts uncles grandma grandpa big sister little sister yeah. big brother friends that they hang around with friends um un- unfortunately well, some, we don't have very many nice people yeah. here like what's going on so, social media, they learn it from social media. So when I say yeah. it's a learned behavior, it's not just the parents that they're learning it from. L- look, look at TV, look at reality TV shows. I yeah. mean, yeah. They're, they're, they're at home watching these and, and learning that it's it's cool to be mean to people because that's what's on TV. That's what's on reality shows. And that that's is so what, pathetic. What Does it seem cool like you're days. plowing the ocean a lot of times? Yeah. Yeah, it just doesn't make any difference, or but but obviously with a hand has, shovel, like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and that's why I've kind of taken on a, a new a- approach to it. I'm not trying to um, completely stop the bullying. The new approach I've taken to it is next week at Robert Stewart we have what's called Kindness Week that I'm putting together, and we're teaching the kids the life skills of kindness. And one um, act of kindness can create a chain reaction. And I'm 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 kind of reapproaching it as if we can teach the kids. Um, the skills that are the opposite of being mean and, and bullying and things like that, um, that he, maybe we can make a difference on on the, the approach See, of bullying. to me, why that's what parents should be teaching your kids. I mean, I remember, your, didn't your mom tell you this, your grandmother, your aunt, your uncle, whatever. Like, to me, it's like, what, they're not even learning this at it's home? It's a different world now. I don't know. You know? I mean, really. it's just crazy. I mean, you have, I mean, you have kids having kids. And they're not raising the kids; they're just allowing them to grow up. Yeah, you know, they're they're well, allowing them like 16, to be raised by yeah. the computer and the Xbox and the TV and exactly. stuff like that. So, yep. so it's have, a whole different world. Has did have we ever had a problem with suicide? And has have you seen this a connection to this, or has it gone down? Because across the country, you would see kids um, and a lot of gay um, kids, uh, teens, you mm-hmm. know, killing themselves. Do you think did we have a problem? Um, my experience so far, I haven't dealt with a student that's actually, um, um, completed the suicide, but I have had several students in my office that have talked about, you know, having thoughts of, of causing harm to themselves. Um, and that, that's when, you know, myself and the school district come together and, and, um, figure out exactly what we need to do in that type of situation to not only get the student help that is being bullied and having these thoughts and and thoughts about harming themselves, but also take swift action on the ones that is causing the bullying and creating issues for that student. Before we run out of time, you've, you've uh, handed me this uh, sheet of paper here. It says rise above bullying. Is this your next step? Hold it up. Oh, I guess I could. I keep forgetting we're on video now. (laughs) I know. Rise (laughs) above bullying. So if you can go to our website and watch a clicks cast, and see that. All right. Yeah. It, this is a new campaign that I'm creating um, called Rise Above Bullying. And I kind of have going along with that kindness approach of um, being kind and going above bullying and, and being better than than being mean and being the kind por- person and, and treating people with respect. And that um, we if we all make the change to be kind to one another, do the random acts of kindness um, and do se- several things to to be nice to one another that that the bullying might might go down and be be limited a little bit. And so um, this campaign's kicking off next week. Um, all of my staff at Robert Stewart and O'Leary have joined on this year. Um, Wednesday, October twenty second next year, we're doing Rise Above Bullying Day, where all of our staff will be wearing. Uh, rise above bullying t-shirts to show that we're all next year or next week next week okay you said next year my apologies (laughs) next week we're about out of time we have literally seconds but have you ever had any kids come back to you and say i'm glad you intervened because if you hadn't i'd have probably killed somebody or you know you saved me from saved me from myself i've had two already really how does that make you feel 
it makes me understand why I do this job and the fight that I'm nice. fighting. Yeah, nice. That's well, keep, keep keep up the good work. Thank you. Absolutely. And be careful out there. We have Thanks. so much more we could talk about, but we're out of time, so we'll have you back. I appreciate it. Thank uh, you. All right. Officer Stephen Gassard with the Twin Falls Police Department School Resource Officer, one of the five. We appreciate it. Yep. And we got Wiley Dobbs next. Next what hour. A transition. That's right. Right oh, yeah. here on Top Story. <laughs> <laughs> 736-0300 is the number to call. Welcome back to Top Story. It's uh, a little chilly today, around 41. I don't know. Is the sun shining? Is it cloudy? What's it doing? I don't know. Sunshine. I know. It's, heat, it? no, it's right. heating up in here, it? isn't it, Wiley? It's heating up in here between you two. I'm going to get out of the, the way. Best. We're changing topics right now. <laughs> Twin Falls School Superintendent Dr. Wiley Dobbs is our guest this morning. Thought we'd have you back. How you doing? Great. Thanks for having me here Always today. good to have you, Wiley. It's always good to be here. We wanted to have you back so you could explain the slashing of uh, the personnel, the part-time personnel in the Twin Falls School District. Well, I'm glad to be back to, to visit with you about that. Uh, I, I think probably um, the article maybe was a little inflammatory. Um, we you think? Did, you know, slash the <laughs> slash tough hack, work? Axe. Um, what, what, in, in reality, what happened is about um, last February, is, is my recollection, I think it was, it was early February, maybe mid-February, we talked with an attorney from our uh, benefits broker. And our attorney let us know that uh, during the 2014-15 school year, there'd be a measurement period. And we would find out we would find out the average hours that people work during this school year, and then we would require to pro- be, be required to provide them with full benefits if they worked over 30 hours. Mm-hmm. Uh, in reality, what's happened is that full-time now is 30 hours uh, yeah. when, in relation to the Affordable Care Act. To provide, we have 150 part-time employees um, that would have met that standard Uh, they were working six hours a day so that was 30 hours and uh, to provide the benefits would have cost our district one million four thousand nine hundred dollars because i think they said that in 2015 they only had to do 70 percent of their employees and then it goes up to 95 percent in 2016 did they take that into account that really wasn't a factor here because we provide uh, insurance for all of our employees that are full time now. Mm-hmm. So that's not a factor for us. Our our issue was we're providing half time benefits for half time employees right now. We would have been required to provide those half time employees as they're related now. We'd have to move them to full time status and provide full time benefits for all of them. So these are we people that were all thirty hours a right. week. So you couldn't reduce them to twenty nine hours and. Well, that's what we did. Just, you just reduced them by one well, hour. Well, that was the hack, the axe, the, the slashing. Slash. Oh. Uh, okay. Was a half hour per day. So so all of our six hour employees were moved to five and a half hours. Now, we we certainly didn't want to do that and and. We, so do they get benefits at all now? They still get their half-time they still benefits get their half-time if, if they choose to, to take them. Okay. Some don't want that because they would have to pay the other half, and, and they have insurance provided from some other, right. maybe their spouse or, or whatever. So, um, And we wanted to give people plenty of time. You know, We didn't want to lose anyone. Yeah. But we also, uh, you know, in March of last year, brought everybody together. Uh, face to face, you know, we didn't send out a memo. You just didn't send out an email? No, we did not. A text? <laughs> or a call. We didn't even make a phone call. We set people down face to face and let them know the situation. And, you know, we didn't want to lose anyone, but we also wanted to make sure we gave them the opportunity to change if that's what they had to do. You yeah, know, if that yeah. half hour per day um, was, was a deal breaker, we knew that we had to give them the time to make those decisions. And we did lose. A few people. Um, How much do you think it affected them um, financially over a year, over the school year? Well, a half, a hour, half hour every day. Yeah, it's you know it depends on where they are in the salary schedule, mm-hmm. uh, and I don't really I I, I wouldn't want to hazard a guess, but you know uh, probably um, over the course of a year maybe a thousand two thousand mm-hmm. dollars okay. total. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, and you, again, the, and it's different depending on the employee. Right. If okay, so if you figure ten hours a month, which that kind of works out mm-hmm. to, and that's over a nine month period. Mm-hmm. Okay, and then you save an average of ten bucks an hour. Is that a fair? That's fair. Okay, so fair. so you got ten ten bucks. Um, uh, see what did I say? 
I don't know. I don't listen to you. <laughs> ten, Wiley, what ten hours a month for nine months would be would be uh, about ninety hours. Ninety, 90 hours, hours at yeah. ten bucks. That's about nine hundred bucks. So that's yeah. about right. Yeah, yeah. about a thousand, just short a thousand dollars a year. I suppose with some workers that could be that could be an issue. You know, for some it was. Yeah, it was an issue, and and uh, the one the main thing we wanted them to know is this is not just being disrespectful to them. We we absolutely. Uh, feel and and know that our paraeducators, which we used to call teachers' aides, right. yeah, right. Uh, paraeducators are uh, are cooks. The the people that work in f- food service, our custodians. Those folks are just critical to what we do. And I heard and they heard they help in classrooms in case you know with the teacher helping a student if they're having. Oh yeah, the para, para para educators are in the classroom. They're mm-hmm. working with the teachers. Uh, they have to meet. Uh, some really high standards in order to get those jobs. They, um, you know, they truly serve as as uh, you know teacher in many in many situations, especially well, the one on one stuff. Yeah, and the oh, article yeah. kind of made it sound like you rounded up about 150 people and said because of Obama and Obamacare, you guys are done. We're we're done with you. So. Yeah, we did. Was we that in the conversation that at all, Wiley? Was that that was that phrase in the conversation at all? No, it wasn't. Okay. <laughs> and but we did let them know. We said we, you know, we had talked to the attorney um, from our benefits provider, and this is what we're faced with. And you know, right now our carryover is less than a million in our district. Now, yeah. you know, eight hundred, nine hundred thousand is a huge money for us sitting right. here. But in a district where you know forty-five million is our budget. Um, you know, that gives us about 3.9 days worth of operating expenses if the bottom falls out. Yeah, yeah. So we're, you know, we're right on the precipice, as are most districts in the state of Idaho. We're still recovering from yeah. the Great Recession, but uh, we, we couldn't afford that. And, and so I think, by and large, the vast majority of our folks understood it. They were appreciative that we let them know uh, way in advance. Mm-hmm. And uh, so... I think we handled it as best we could, and and again, we're we're very uh, sorry that we have to make any kind of cuts at all. But um, that's the way it happened. But, and and some people are budget. saying, you know, and some people are saying, well, Kimberly didn't have to do that, and Jerome didn't have to do that, but they're smaller districts too. Would that be the reason? Or well, they're smaller districts, and in calling around and looking around, we found that we have a lot more part-time people than most districts, hmm. and mm-hmm. so we've utilized our funding. Uh, to provide uh, part-time help uh, in in many situations involving our uh, food service programs, the help we get to the kids, um, and the people who come on and, and work that way are looking for part-time work. Uh, they know that it's not a full-time gig; it's part-time, yeah. and and um, that's attractive to a lot of people. They, they want that. Well, especially part-time. even if you can get half-time benefits. I mean, that's right. a perfect that right there. Sure. Top story, you're on the air with Wiley Dobbs. Good morning. Hey, good morning, Kelly Jules, Carl. Good Carl, morning. Carl, how are you? Hey, uh, well, I have a 10-year-old stepdaughter that's in, uh, goes to Harrison School, and I was kind of wondering, how is this going to affect, you know, the programs that they have at the school that she participates in? That's a, that's a great question, Carl, and a lot, a lot of people want to know how that how that's going to affect my my kids. You know, yeah, if, if you have yeah. kids in our school district, what we've done is is uh, maybe trimmed a little bit off the start time that the the uh, para educa- If it's a para educator, this doesn't affect anything dealing with the teacher in the classroom, okay. but the extra help that we provide with the para educator. Uh, they start probably, you know, we trimmed a little bit off their morning start and a little bit off the end start. So instead of starting maybe uh, at 9 and ending at 3.30 because they have a half-hour lunch, they, they'll start 15 minutes later and and finish 15 minutes earlier. Yeah, okay. So in the overall scheme of things, it's it doesn't sound that bad. It, it, you know, it it, as it, we, we handled as best we could, and I, I think that with minimal damage, if you will, uh, the kids probably won't notice much of a change. Yeah. Uh, it'll be a little bit of time off in the morning, a little in the evening, or in the in the afternoon as they they uh, in school. But um, again, we didn't want to do that. We we would have preferred to have kept it that way, and we don't want to minimize the fact that it is a cut to some people, and we didn't want to have to do that. But um, I, but I feel said, like we made the right decision. Well, yeah, and well, I guess if you had more money, you know, obviously coming into education, you wouldn't have to deal with this, right? Well, maybe, maybe not. I mean, a million dollars is a pretty big price tag uh, 
um, to to keep people fifty, you know, for the for the time I'm talking here. I mean, this is kind of a business decision. Sometimes, yeah. you know, uh, you have to make a business decision uh, for the good of the organization. And I'm not, um, I, I don't know that we would continue to have those folks work fifteen minutes this side and that side of their of their half or their part time day. To spend and spend a million dollars on that, I, I we'd have to weigh that out. Hmm. Do you see this correcting itself in the in the future, where maybe you can go back to the way it was? Or well, I don't unless there's a change to uh, the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare. I, I just don't uh, see how we would be able to provide um, full time benefits to a group of folks that used to be considered part time. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, but you also said it was cooks and janitors and things like that. Mostly paraeducators, the teacher. Um, so it's mostly that group. Mostly that group and our uh, food service folks. We have some uh, custodians. We call them casual custodians. They're like substitute custodians. If a, a custodian oh, is gets sick? sick, then we we float them. A casual. In there. A lot of stuff goes on in the background that we yeah. we don't we think no about. Idea. Well, and then I it this just is the struck expose. me as that's Tell probably, us, Wiley. Yeah, it's probably <laughs> that's probably a funny term as I I said it. I thought casual yeah, custodian. Yeah, casual custodian. That's right. Not serious, just casual. <laughs> yeah, it's happening. <laughs> Now the got the, got the peanut gallery left. Thank you, Eva. All right. Now, <laughs> now the school board just recently passed an emergency levy of what about a million dollars? Correct. Uh, but this wasn't associated with this other issue. No, uh, we have a, a budget advisory committee. It's made up of uh, people from our community, um, people from within our school district, and uh, the uh, emergency levy is is money that helps us pay for the cost of the additional students that we got, the influx that we got. We, we started with about uh, 250 more students this year than we started with last year. So does anybody say, well, they passed it for a million for that, couldn't they put another million in and keep these people employed? Well, we have to pay for new people to work with the, the new kids. So I see. So it's it's not like uh, we stayed with the same number of employees and then added a million, you know, yeah, the million yeah. emergency levy. We we had to add employees, some pair pair educators to help in classrooms that are that have the high numbers. How big are the classrooms now? Well, in most cases, we're optimal. We're we're in pretty good shape. But the largest ones we have some 30, 31, 32 kids in in the classroom. In in uh, probably fifth grade is our our major area. And, and in three schools, we have classrooms that are 30 and above. So, Wiley, did you not anticipate? Because I know you guys plan, like, all these kids coming. Just more people moving into the area? And we is may this have to be wait until a... the next segment yep. to answer that question. Okay, well, the rest of the question is, is, is this going to be a problem going forward? Mm-hmm. All right, That's so we'll be right question. back to Twin Falls School Superintendent Dr. Wiley Dobbs here on Top Story. We are back. 736-0300 is the number to call. We have Twin Falls School Superintendent Dr. Wiley Dobbs. If you have any questions or comments for him, this would be the time before right. he goes back into his cage, I guess. If, I know, if your little snowflake know. got a bad grade, yeah. call in and then talk to Wiley Dobbs about it. See if he can fix it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure there's something I can do. I'm sure. <laughs> We know you can, Wiley. We know you can. <laughs> By the way, yesterday's $100 instant winning name in the uh, $100 word of the day is Janice, uh, what, yeah, what? Janice Reeves. Janice Reeves. Congratulations. And your $100 word of the day for today is host. Host. H-O-S-T. Host. host. So go to our website, newsradio1310.com. Click on word of the day. Type in host. Listen tomorrow. If you're your name tomorrow and you played the word today, it's 100 bucks, just like that. All right, so we got a phone call coming in, but uh, let's go back. Your your question to my repeat question, that question: You needed the emergency. It was emergency levy for 250 extra kids that have flooded the system. Mm-hmm. Um, you, I know in, in some of your past speeches, you talk about how you've calculated how many mm-hmm. kids come each year. Why was this a surprise? And is this something that the taxpayers should be expecting from? you know, in the future. You need to sharpen your pencil or something here. Well, and that's a great question. And in the spring, we meet with every principal. We go around and we we work with each principal to project what we believe our classes, you know, each class is going to be, each grade level, each class, and the secondary level, of course, it's by grade. Um, And we we came pretty close. 
uh, and we were able to hire the, the adequate number of teachers for the most part. We missed it in fifth grade, uh, and we had, we had a, a group, a, a larger number of fifth graders move in than any other grade level. So it was one of those things. And here's the problem. In years past, uh, back when I was director of operations and I would watch the then superintendent, Dr. Donick, uh, work, he was able to do some things at the end of August and hire a couple of teachers and place them where they were needed. There's no one left in August to hire. Uh, we have a teacher shortage. Hired? We have a teacher shortage. Uh, we we have probably six teachers that we have hired that aren't accredited, uh, that don't have their uh, credential for that specific uh, classroom. For example, we've hired, we have one of our employees is a student teacher. Hmm. That's all we could, you know, that's all we could find. That was the best that's that we could find. That's a little scary, isn't it? It is scary. And, and that's one of the reasons why, you know, the the effort on the part of the legislature to raise the uh, uh, pay for teachers, I think, is a good is good. It's well, it's well aimed. Have you uh, lost a lot of teachers to other states that pay better? You know, or been they asked, just don't want to come here? Yeah, I've okay. been asked that question. And, you know, I don't really have data that would suggest we've lost a flood of teachers from our district to other states. Uh, but the big problem is, is that we're having teachers retire. Mm -hmm. And the pipeline for teachers that are, you know, coming to Idaho is, is drying up. And I, I think they're just taking a, a look at the states around us even. Yeah. And that the pay is quite a bit higher. Yeah. Do we still have a caller? No, we don't. Do I'm you. sorry. Call back. <clears throat> Please call back. <laughs> call back. Ask Dr. Dobbs what you want to ask him. Yeah. So now we are getting ready to build a couple of elementary schools and a middle mm -hmm. school, right? We are. Uh, we're going to build one elementary school in the east across from uh, Hankins, across Hankins from the Boy Scouts office. Uh, we've got one in the northwest, which will be at the corner of uh, Grandview and Federation. Federation doesn't go through yet, but it will. Okay. And then the middle school will go in the south on Harrison and 3600. Okay. So that constraint. Now, you're, you're kind of in the process now of getting uh, the, the bonds have already been passed. You're in the process. When will construction start? Uh, we'll uh, start breaking ground this early spring, um, okay. maybe late winter uh, as we move toward this next uh, year. So Wiley, what do you think the growth is? Because, you know, we have Cliff Bar coming, mm -hmm. that's like 400 people and uh, out of the area, I assume, because I don't mm -hmm. even know if we have the workforce for it. Are you prepared for, for the future growth? We are because of these schools. Uh, last year, that was our big um, task before us last year is we were having this influx. You know, Twin Falls School District in just three years were more than a thousand students, more than we had. Three wow. years ago. I know. Isn't that That's a little amazing. scary? So like, we're, you... Well, we're on an incline. Yeah. Um, it's not scary because our patrons helped us. You know, I guess you could say the Calvary's on the way. We've got schools that we're going to build. Uh, we'll be set up where we can handle uh, 1,650 students in each of our high schools. So you'll have enough for the high schools. That to, should to take us take to about up. 2030. Um, we will have... Uh, middle school capacity for years to come because we'll have three middle schools with about 700 each. Uh, each of the middle schools have a capacity of 1,000. Uh, the elementary schools will have two new elementary schools. But, um, you know, probably what we'll need in the future, uh, maybe in, in 2022, 2023 is what we're projecting, is another elementary school. Hmm. Wow. So, so we, we've got a pretty good handle on it. Uh, and what the growth is, it is the economic development that we've seen in our community. I, I'm sure of that. Hmm. Yeah. Well, Dr. Wiley Dobbs, thank you very much. It's always fun we talking to you. We appreciate it, Wiley. We thank go back you. a long way, so we always talk about back in the old times. Back in the old the days. That's Wiley, what I, how do you guys, what, 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 how far back did you go? Oh, we go way back. Way, Is it way, way back? back? Oh, way, way, way You got back. any stories way on back. Kelly I could use? I got several stories okay. on Kelly. <laughs> we'll talk As we're Rotary. leading up to his retirement, I let know. me know if you want to have me on. <laughs> I do, I do. <laughs> All right. Thanks, <laughs> Thanks Dr. Wiley. Dobbs. We appreciate Thanks, it. Thanks, you guys. We'll be right back here on Top Story.
Welcome back. Ooh, I better turn this down. 7360300 is the number to call here on Top Story. We're going to get a report on October feast from last night in just a moment. That's right. We said call back, let us know how it was. That's right. That's right. I think so, we gave it to Joe, Steve, and Leah. Yeah, and we got Leah on because that was part of the deal. You tell us how it was, and we'll give you the tic- extra <laughs> ticket. <laughs> we but are so cruel. Before we do that, though, I just wanted to mention as the uh, irrigation season kind of. Uh, wanes a little bit for the year it'll be starting up as quicker than you think and uh because of that you want to do some planning this winter time for your irrigation system and you'll want to budget and it's not going to cost a lot but you need to get a hold of far more of idaho and see how much it's going to cost to have overflights of your fields so that they can give you these infrared photographs and you can study your fields and see which ones are not being watered properly uh, might have too much water here, not enough there. Uh, and get that in the plan for now so it won't be a big surprise this coming spring. But this is the one of those things that you can budget for that will pay back many times over. Because once you fix the problems in your pivot or your irrigation system, you will notice that your crops are yielding more. So this is one of those deals where it doesn't cost it pays. Mm. And ask them about Infrared Baron and Farmore of Idaho. Their number is 324-3341 uh, and they're online at farmoreofidaho.com. Infrared Baron. And ask them to explain it a little more to you because it's quite a fascinating thing that they're doing now with technology and agriculture. Seven three six zero three hundred is the uh, number to call. All right, we're going to get our report now. We have Leah. Good morning, Leah. Good morning, you two. Good morning. How are you today? Did you have fun? Oh, we had a blast last night. Um, We didn't get there until about halfway through. Um, I had some business I still had to take care of. And um, we got there and were ushered right in. And um, everybody seemed to be having a good time. We thought, well, okay, we're we're set to go. The food was great. Um, I have a tendency to ask questions. So we wanted to know how... Um, the Kiwanis got started and what they were doing. And so we just, we even found out that um, the turf club used to be part of Hanson. Hanson. Really? Hanson what? Yeah. The town of Hanson? Yes. Oh, Hanson. Um, yes. The, oh. The building? When, well, the, the turf club. Um, I didn't and know it that. was, well, when you walk into the turf club, on the left-hand That's side, right. there's a little counter where the, the coke room is. Yes. yes. There's a little 8 by 10 um, frame, and it has the story in it. So we were talking to the guys that we had originally talked to about, you know, the Kiwanis Club, and they're 100 years old this year, et cetera. Um, the guys are I the, thought, the guys I thought the Ray club. was looking a little gray around the edges there when we had him in talking about Oktoberfeast. <laughs> yeah. So, so anyhow, um, we we started chit chatting about that, and now I've got to go down here to the city hall because nobody knows where it actually was. But it was on a piece of property that they said it was ten miles southeast of Twin. Huh. And and they talked the city of Hanson into um, what's the word I want incorporating that piece of property into the city. Oh, and so they could it? Ask, yes, that's the word. Thank you, Joe. You're welcome. I haven't had enough coffee yet. That's okay. <laughs> so it was, yeah, it was a great night. So it wasn't actually in the town of Hanson because if it was but, ten miles southwest, probably would have been quite a ways south. Southeast, yeah. 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 Um, so, so yeah, that's. So how was the, how was the sauerkraut? Oh, delicious! <laughs> Here we're finding out good history, and then Jill wants to know about the food. That should well, have been my well, line. I, well, you know, because they make it homemade, that's and so right. I'm always I know curious about do. that. Yeah, I know yeah. They do. And I want to know. I mean, the the red sauerkraut that they had. I want the recipe because that was the best I have ever had. Yeah, you might well, have to go I to know, Germany. I know Ray Parrish. Do you know Ray Parrish? Yes. Okay, he's the. He's the guy with the recipe. He even traveled to Germany and paid huge amounts of money for that recipe and brought it back. He paid money wow. for the recipe? Oh, absolutely, yeah. You're and, joking. Yeah, yeah. I, and he's, I think he's still making payments You're on You're joking. It. So, but well, he's the guy responsible for the recipe, so he works for DL Evans Bank. So you give him a call and you tell him you want the recipe. You tell him that I told you to call 
uh, him, and he would give you the recipe. Well, he might I not. Will do that. He what? might not. He might not. I don't. I oh, haven't yeah, even given my best no, friend, will. my stepmom. It's kind of like with uh, Wiley Dobbs. I know enough on race, and so we went to school together. That you know, he's he'll do anything I tell I say. Is that right? <laughs> well, Lee, I'm glad well, you had a good time, and thanks for letting us know. Yeah, that was well, fun. and thank you for the extra ticket. That that made it easy to take my. We have company in from out of town. Oh, so. cool. that was nice. All right. And he was very impressed. <laughs> well, good. Very good. Well, we appreciate you getting the tickets and going and reporting back to us. So Thank you. We'll talk to you soon. And don't forget to get reporter. a hold of Ray. Don't forget to get a hold of Ray and tell me He's Kelly said to give, give him that recipe. recipe. I'll bet he will. I bet, I'll bet you he will. won't. What do you want to bet? We'll be right okay. back here on Top Story. Seven three six zero three zero zero is the number to call here on Top Story. Stanley and Company has the low and honey loader, but of course you knew that, right? I did. Loads any kind of manure, liquid, frozen, or dry, and up to seven miles an hour. And uh, you can, if you have a feedlot or dairy operation, you might be interested in one of these, and you can see one in operation before you buy. And you can call Pat Hartzell. He can set up an appointment so you can see one. You can kick the tires. You can knock on the thing. You can talk to the owner, talk to the operator, get all the skinny about the low and honey loader before you plunk down your hard-earned money mm -hmm. for one of those. And then if you decide, yep, I want to buy one, Pat Hartzell can do that too. I'll bet he'd have a contract in his rig. His personal cell is 280-1167. Give him a call, 280-1167. Tell him that Kelly and Jill told you That's to call. That's right. Yeah. We got a caller, so let's okay. go ahead and take it here. Top story, you're on the air. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hey, I went to the October feast uh, <laughs> last night, and it was great. I got there about 10 minutes to 5, and 99% of the parking lot was full. Oh, oh. wow. Yeah, now, you, you had a ticket from us, too, didn't you? Yes, I did. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. You're welcome. And, well, I wrote I wrote clicks on the back of that, so you should have gotten VIP treatment. Oh, I did. I did. They okay. yeah. me. The, the Kiwanis were dressed in green vests, and they took you to seat. There must have been about eight guys, <laughs> and uh, they take you, took you to your table, you know, and it, and it was kind of cafeteria style, just long tables and, yeah. and, uh, or convention style. I mean, and, uh, so I told the guy, well, sit me next to a couple of hot chicks <laughs> and he sat me down. Did it work? To, oh yeah. They, they were a little older than I was, but they were a lot of fun. I was probably the youngest guy there at that time. And I'm 67. Ooh. <laughs> I wonder, I wonder if he sat next to Leah. <laughs> <laughs> and her friends. I don't know, but it was a lot of fun. And, and um, How but, was uh, the music? That, well, the music was over the speakers, you know, the PA system. Mm -hmm. And it, it had the theme of German, you know. Polka, polka, uh, polka. Beer drinking, you know, polka and all of that kind of stuff. And it, but it wasn't real loud, so you could have conversation. And it, it was really a lot of fun. Oh, good. Another thing, the, um, the lady you called about um, the turf club. Yeah. In uh, the Times News, they were having a Magic Valley's 100 Best mm -hmm. series for a while, and they had one on the Turf Club, and I believe it was the sign that was in Hanson. And the guy who built that sign oh. also did a lot of work in Las Vegas on the, on the old strip, or maybe it was the downtown area, but that was moved. So I'm going to have to look that article up again. You can yeah. probably get it on your uh, computer, Jill. Yeah. Uh, Times News Valley's 100 best. And yeah. I'll, bet, I'll bet Michelle Matthews would know. Oh, yeah. She's, Michelle yeah. knows She's kind everything. Of the, uh, she does. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. I'm glad you had a good time. Yeah. Well, the food was great. Everything was great. They had young high school girls running around, you know, giving coffee. And, and I had one beer. And uh, it was a great time. I'm going next year. All right. All Sounds right. Good. Well, All right. We, thanks a lot. We appreciate the report. Out. Okay, yeah. that's two. Now, where's the third one? <laughs> Yeah, I can't remember the name on the third third Steve. ticket. Was it Steve? That's yeah. right. It was Steve, and he yeah, gave a last Steve name, Hinton. too. Hinton. Yeah, there you go. See, just blurt it out there to the there world. That's okay. He well, did he yesterday. won yesterday. I know. Okay, I know. Sorry. I'm just kidding. Okay, All right, so. please, please. Okay, well, now we know that October Feast was great. If you didn't attend it, you should attend it next year. Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, just a couple of other news items to talk about we haven't gotten to yet. Uh, when we talked to him on the show... Uh, I don't know, some time back, I don't remember when, Will Brown, yes, uh, the air pistol athlete, uh, the Twin Falls scored a U.S. Olympic quota to start things right, for the, according to the Times News, uh, 
for the USA shooting team competing at the Championship of the Americas in Guadalajara, Mexico. So we have for him. we have an Olympic shooter from right here in Twin Falls. And he was on our show. That's right. He's a 2013 World Cup USA gold medalist. He was the team's first rifle or pistol athlete to earn an Olympic quota. Good for him. I'll say. He was nice a nice kid. young man. Yeah, he really he was. 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 He came with his dad. Kind of, and... kind of quiet, kind of reserved, you know, and kind yeah. of had that sheepish grin. He doesn't have to talk. He can shoot. That's Yeah, that's right. Well, when you can shoot, you don't have to you talk. You don't have to talk. Well, congratulations, <laughs> Will. Absolutely. And I know that you are a big sports fan, and apparently the Kansas City Royals are going to be in the, the World, World Series. Series. They won four straight last night. So I guess Kansas City has really... Um, revitalized. I, I was reading an article about it on the plane coming back from Atlanta, and uh, really, they've they've invested money in their downtown, and just it's really a destination city, really great. And so this really? is kind of caps off the fact that they have this great team, and they're they're really like the Moneyball team. Honestly, they don't have any stars. If if anyone saw that baseball, did you see the baseball movie Moneyball? No. Where they kind of pick guys on. Their statistics, and you know, you you hit better if you hit on the second swing or the first swing. You know, they weren't oh, stars, but yeah. they put it together. And there was um, a show out. Yeah, I did. It was, was Moneyball with Brad Pitt. Yes, I didn't think they Jenna called Hill. it Moneyball, but I did see it's that Moneyball. show. That was yeah. very interesting. Yeah, and so anyway, it's kind of neat that they're really not huge stars, and they're yeah. um, winning, and they weren't expected to even get this far. And now, who knows, they'll probably win the World Series you know, this year. That kind of goes with actors, too, because once in a while you'll see these independent films with people you never heard of before, and yet it's a great movie. Yeah. You know, so... Anyway. It's not always whose name is up in lights. Way to go, Kansas City Royals. Yeah, there you go. I'm, I'm happy for Kansas City. Yeah, it's kind of it's a nice uh, underdog story. And it's time now for the Huckabee Report, which is brought to you today, as every day, by Waddell and Reed. You can hear the Huckabee Report each weekday at this time, brought to you exclusively by Waddell and Reed. Laura Nelson, Josh Funk, and Steve Stanger are the financial advisors, and the number is 736-6563. Here's what I'm looking for. What are you looking for, Kelly Glass? Well, we got Bish's uh, Trick or Treat on Bish's Street coming up. Yes. On October 31st, Halloween Day. Mm. That's a Friday. It is a Friday, and I'm sure the cops are thrilled. <laughs> Yeah, Things probably Things always so. go a little awry. <laughs> uh, it's going to be good because uh, we're having trick-or-treat on Bish's Street uh, with Bish's RV. They set up all of their RVs in a big circle, mm -hmm. and it's going to be in the parking lot of Fred Meyer this year. Oh, at Fred Meyer. Yeah, so wow. it's going to be a nice big area there. It starts at 3.30. It goes until 6. Uh, you can dress up the kids, head for the Fred Meyer parking lot on Blue Lakes, uh, for trick-or-treating door-to-door in RVs provided by Bish's RV Supercenter. And there's different sponsors that uh, get an RV uh, for the evening, for the afternoon, and they hand out stuff. And I, I you know, I, I know there's dental folks that hand out like toothbrushes and Which stuff like that. Which the kids like will need right afterwards. <laughs> That's right. Uh, I know the county sheriff's department always participates yeah. in that, and it's just, it's really a lot of fun. It is it's fun. a good place to bring the kids, get them all dressed up under their Halloween costumes. It's over at six, so if you wanted to quit then, you'd be fine because they'll have a lot of stuff in their bag, but it's early enough to where if there are other Halloween things going on that the kids want to be involved in, you still have plenty of time to do That's that. That's right. So I would suggest come down. It's a nice, safe environment. If you're worried is, about yeah. your kids walking in the dark, because it is dark. And tripping over each yeah. other or, you know, whatever. It's a nice, safe environment. They get plenty of candy. Yes, they do. And, and it's so all, does and it's Kelly. Enough. I <laughs> never eat any candy. Never, 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 ever. Kelly, Kelly, Kelly I think Kelly, I'm going to go class. dressed up in an uh, Ebola outfit. Really? <laughs> I thought you'd maybe go as, I don't know, a retiring co-host. Well, I could do that, too. Yeah. yeah. I could just show up the way I am. Because your costume broke. It did. I'm a little upset about that. I had one of those little green leprechaun hats. That was when we were in the um, St. Patty's Day parade. I know, and I had that thing for several years, and the band broke, and you know, I, I need to find another one, I guess, because that was nobody could guess who I was when I had that little hat on. I'll tell you, no one. No. It was such a mystery. Uh, that was incognito, man. I could rob a bank wearing that, and nobody would know who I was. I know. We'll go find. Well, of course, a all you have to you. do to do that anymore is just hand them a note, anyway. So it's or not a big be deal. in a wheelchair and just get a cab. <laughs> yeah, Take it. a cab over there. You don't even have to roll there. <laughs> 
Hey, thanks. You can dress up as a bank robber yeah, in a wheelchair. Go. <laughs> Good idea. <laughs> I might twin. do that. We've got a wheelchair. I might do that. Okay. <laughs> All right. Who do we have tomorrow? Do you have the... I do. We have a lot tomorrow. We have the CSI. We have a comedian, Key Lewis. We have Christina Glasscock, the, the county oh, clerk, yeah. talking about what's happening with the elections, gay marriage. We have Sandy March from the Rotary After Hours Club. They're having a Rotary Cemetery tour. Man, lots of stuff coming La. up. Tomorrow. All right. And well, hopefully a little Open Mind Friday. All right. See you then. Have a good day. Goodbye, Jill. Bye, Cal.